My name is Justin, and I am a son of God and an addict and the host of the Rico 12 speaker meeting. And thanks to my God, the steps and the fellowship of other addicts, I'm sober one day at a time since June 19th, 2015. And for that, I am beyond grateful. Welcome to Rico 12. We are an organization whose addictions include alcohol, drugs, lust and sex, food and gambling, just to name a few. We come together from all places, faiths and backgrounds to learn the similarities of addiction and to gain tools and hope from others who are walking a similar path. We invite recovering addicts with at least one year sobriety and who are actively working their recovery in their respective fellowships to share their experience, strength, and hope on a live Zoom webinar each Friday at noon central time for, for 20 to 25 minutes. Then we, the live audience, get the opportunity to ask questions of the speaker for another 20 to 25 minutes. If you're hearing this meeting in recorded podcast form and would like to participate as a live audience member in the future, please go to www.reco12.com, that's R-E-C-O-1-2 dot com, to learn more and to submit your email address there to receive weekly invitations. Rico 12 is a self-supporting service, and we appreciate your help in keeping us work our, working our 12th step in this manner. We gratefully accept contributions to help cover the cost of the Zoom platform, podcast platform, uh, web hosting, and administrative costs. To contribute, you can go to rico12.com forward slash support, or you can click the link to PayPal that will be in the chat of the live meeting and also in the show notes of the podcast. When you contribute, please specify the meeting number. This is number 75, and we're grateful for that. That's an awesome that we've made it to 75. Uh, one more word about our speakers before we introduce today's speaker. When we line up a guest speaker for a meeting, we ask them to seek guidance on what and how to present so that they can reflect the light they've been given. That light will inspire hope, meaning, worth, and growth in us, the listening audience. Now let's introduce our speaker for today, Dennis T., whose topic is Made a Beginning. Now here's a little bit about Dennis. Dennis T. is from Alaska. He has been sober and in recovery since July 29th of 2014. He finally found freedom from sexaholism, drug addiction, gaming addiction, and pain pills only to discover that it was self that had defeated him. These other addictions were only symptoms. He had to quit playing God. Now, before I turn the floor over to you, I invite you to get out, get out your big books, a pen and a highlighter. I've got all mine here ready to go. I'm sure this is going to be a great one. Dennis, take it away with God. The floor is yours. All right. Thank you. First off, I just want to ask that I would just get out of the way and leave the results all up to God. I want to thank everybody for being here, helping me stay sober today. I'm really humbled to be invited to do this. Um, when Justin asked, you know, what do I want to share? It came, what's fresh on my mind recently is that he made a beginning. And so that's a topic that's really near and dear to my heart. And I think in order to really cover it in detail, that I need to kind of backtrack just a little bit before we get to it to kind of set up what I have found in this program. And um, we're going to start out just real quick. We're going to do a brief overview of We Agnostics. It's basically our step two. And what I've learned about We Agnostics, you know, I thought We Agnostics was there to introduce me to a higher power. And I came in with a very strong faith background. So I didn't really think I needed We Agnostics. I thought that would be a chapter I can skip, but I have found an even more important message was not to introduce me to a power greater than myself, but to introduce me to the power that I had been using all along and that power didn't work. And the more I get into this program, the more I realize that self is what's defeating me. And as we go through this, I'm going to try and point out where the big book really shows me self is almost a, a separate entity that, that is defeating me and just my need to be rid of self. Um, we start in, in We Agnostics. I'm going to start on page 44. At the bottom of the second paragraph, it says, and this was mine, to be doomed to a sexaholic, alcoholic, drug addiction, death, or to live on a spiritual basis. They're not always easy alternatives to face. When I first read that, I was in such despair. I thought, man, that's an easy alternative. I'll take the spiritual basis. But I didn't know yet what that meant. I didn't realize that it meant death of that self that's been running my life. I don't think that self is evil, but I think that self is trying to do God's job. It's And that's what makes it so full of fear. It's expecting perfection. And when it doesn't live up to 
God's job, oh man, it will rake me over the coals. It will, um, that's why I've always needed all these other things that are symptoms. So we agnostic starts out on page 45 and it tells me, you know, my problem was never a lack of faith because I had faith. I had a good faith tradition. It was never um, a lack of uh, a belief. I, I did believe. It wasn't the lust. It wasn't the drugs and alcohol. It was a lack of power. That was my dilemma. And I really believed that I had power, um, that God was there. But I had begged God a thousand times to take it, and it didn't work. But it says that we had to find a power by which we could live, and it had to be a power greater than myself. But obviously, where and how were we to find this power? And the next 40 pages really lays that out for me. And it says, well, that's exactly what this book is about. Its main object is to enable me to connect or find a power greater than myself, which will solve my problem. Now, it doesn't say which will help me solve my problem, because my problem is self. My problem is in the way of connecting to that power. And that's exactly what the instructions of this book is going to help me to find a way to finally deflate my ego, to deflate the self that's taking me out. So it starts trying to introduce me because self is so insidious that it can camouflage itself to where it leads me to believe through narratives that's running all the time that other people and institutions are the problems. So I'm always, I have always been looking outward is what's causing all this disturbance inward. And I never realized it was self that was defeating me. So as we start going through, we start on fit, we hit on 52 and it says, and it asks me some questions in the bedevilments. Was I having trouble with personal relationships? Man, as a sexaholic, the answer is 100% yes. Um, I have personal problems when I'm in my disease, when I'm in self, with coworkers, with family, with friends, with my children, with my neighbors, with the driver on the road, uh, that we couldn't control our emotional natures. That was a wreck. Um, where we pray to misery and depression. And... I couldn't make a living. That one I didn't suffer so much from. Uh, did I have feelings of uselessness? Was I full of fear? I'm either living in self-centered fear when self is running the show, or when I am surrendered, self is deflated. I'm living in God-centered love. And that is really the difference between fear and love is I can rest and let God run the show. It goes on in, on page 53, because I, I want us to see at the top of the page, it says, it is not by chance that we were given the power to reason, the small r, to examine the evidence of our senses, Hang on, let me start my time. Um, to draw a conclusion. That was one of man's magnificent attributes. But down on the second paragraph, it says, when we became addicts, crushed by self, which created a self-imposed crisis, we could not postpone or evade. We had, fears, we had to fearlessly face the proposition that either God is everything or he is nothing. God either is or he isn't. What was our choice to be? So this, we agnostic is introducing me now to exactly, well, what is this power that I've been using all along? Because it says that some of us had already walked far over the bridge of reason, and it's using a capital R now. That's telling me that my willpower, that my will is the power that I've been using all along because self is in control. It said toward the desired short of faith. The outlines and the promise of the new land, which is sobriety and recovery, where safe self is deflated and God is now in control of my life, had brought luster to tired eyes and fresh courage to flagging spirits. Friendly hands had stretched out in the program and welcome. We were grateful that reason, or self, capital R, had brought us so far, but somehow we couldn't quite step ashore because perhaps we've been leaning on self or reason, capital R, um, too much that last mile, and we did not like to lose our support. So <clears throat> for me, we agnostic introduces not so much the power of faith that I had, but the one that I was actually using coming into the program. And this is where the real, um, our today is going to start is on page 60. This is where after 
I come to the realization that I do need a power greater than myself that's been leading me all this time to deliver me from sanity. So on page 60, it's really going to give me a great example of well, what is the self that's defeating me. And it says that being convinced of these three items, that as a sexaholic, as an addict, I could not manage my own life, and I can't. When I'm in self, my life is unmanageable. That probably no human power could have relieved my sexaholism. I would say that's 100% absolute. Nothing I've ever tried. Church programs, men's groups, purity conferences, um, nothing worked. And I think the reason is, is because getting sober is not the answer. Sober is not well. Because once I get sober, the illness of self is still there. And that's really, as we go through this journey today, hopefully, that's what I'm hoping you can really see, um, what the real disease is. It's that self is what's defeating us, and that God could and would if he were sought. So being convinced we're at step three, which is that we decided to turn our will, our thinking, the self that's running the show, my willpower, and our life, my actions, over to God as I understood him. That just means that God now is I'm inviting God to take care of me, that I'm going to give up that control and allow God to do for me what I can't do for myself. And the next paragraph is what shows me, well, what's it like to be in self for me? Well, the first requirement is that I be convinced. And I mean that on a heart level that, and sometimes the pain of addiction and the bottom that that brings me to a new bottom where I finally reach desperation, that's convinced that, man, something has to change. That any life run on self, self-will, or we could say self's will, right? Because this self's is the one that's running the show, will, can hardly be a success. On that basis, and here it is, we are almost always in collision with something or somebody, even though our motives are good. And that's a good question to take a second and ask yourself, am I in collision with somebody or someone around me? And in self, that is true. Um, I don't want to get off topic because I want more stuff that I want to share. But, you know, I always felt like when my family was around me and I was in self, that they were abandoning me, you know, but that, you know, that, oh, you know, and then I feel self-pity, like, oh, everybody's leaving me and they're being mean to me. But the truth is, when I'm in self, even though I'm not drinking or acting out or I'm completely sober, there's like this invisible field that's emitting from me that anybody that stands in that field is getting sick. So I wrote an article called Running for Higher Ground. And that's what my wife, my family, the people around me, that when I'm in um, self, they're not abandoning me. They're running for higher ground so they can get out of that field because it's causing them to be sick. That's why sober is not well. I can have sobriety without recovery, but I cannot have recovery without sobriety. And recovery for me is the deflation of self. And then we're going to look at well, how do we get that? Um, all of page 61, if you go through there with this idea that self's will, that self if you read that, put your name in there and look at how self runs your life. We can't do it today. You can really see how self needs and wants to run the show. But we find out as we get through our steps, self's sole purpose is to take care of me, to take care of self. And it'll be manipulative. It'll lie. It'll everything it does. It'll have expectations. Expectations are resentments that are forming. Everything it does is to benefit self. And I can't see it. I'm too blind to that. When people don't do as I need them to do so that I'm okay, then they're the problem. And that's not true. So if we turn to 62, this is where we really get to 62 and 63 is here. We're really going to get to look at this self and what it looks like. Because it tells me that selfishness and self-centeredness, so now we're talking about self, that we think is the root of our troubles. It says driven. If I'm being driven, I'm not the one driving. So it's telling me that this self in me that's running the show, that I'm being driven around by a hundred forms of fear, that self-delusion, 
self-seeking and self-pity. We step on the toes of our fellows and they retaliate. Now we think that they are retaliating us for no reason because we can't see it yet. Sometimes they hurt us seemingly without provocation. But if we invariably find at some point, at some time in the past, when this gets revealed to us through our fourth through nine steps, we have made a decision based on self, which later places us in a position to be heard. So our troubles, we think, are basically of our own making. They arrive out of self. And the sexaholic, alcoholic addict is an extreme example of self run riot, though we use it as it thinks so. Now, here's the warning. Above everything, we addicts must be rid of this self. We must or it kills us. And here's the promise God makes that possible. Dropping to the last sentence in the paragraph, neither could we reduce our self-centeredness much by wishing or trying on our own power, our own reasoning, our own having self try to do it. It doesn't work because we had to have God's help. So these are the instructions that they give us. And this is where we really make the third step decision. It's not the prayer that we make it. It's right here because it says this is the how and why of it. So it's going to tell me how and why. First of all, we decided that we had to quit playing God. So right there, I'm, I, I can see that I have to quit playing God. And that's what, when I'm in self, I'm doing God's job. I'm trying to do what I'm designed to have God do, and it doesn't work. It says, next, we decided, here's their third step. And hereafter in this drama of life, and boy, is my life drama, God was going to be my director. He's the principal. I'm going to let him run the show. We are his agents. He is the father, and we are his children. It says most good ideas are simple. And this concept is that I'm going to let, I'm making a decision now to let God run the show for me was the keystone of a new and triumphant arch through which we pass to freedom. Now, an arch takes several, it can't just build an arch on sand. So the foundation is the fellowship. We come into the program on page 17 and it talks about, well, the foundation of the fellowship is good and it's, but the powerful cement, it's not enough in itself to keep us sober. Then it goes into the cornerstone where the guy at the end of, um, uh, end of the, we agnostic, he, um, he says that the barriers or the old ideas, the self running, you know, he's getting to see finally the power of him running the show. He had, and this is at the bottom of 56, he had built through the years, were swept away. He stood in the presence of infinite power and love because he stepped down and now he's experiencing that. He had stepped from bridge to shore because he gave up self. For the first time, he lived in conscious companionship with his creator. Thus was our friend's cornerstone fixed in place. He had a willingness to believe, and then he believed. He could experience what that's like. And that experience as we go through this next section, because it tells us that when we sincerely took such a position where I've made this decision, which is step three, all sorts of remarkable things followed. We had a new employer being all powerful. He provided what we needed if we kept close to him and performed his work well. Established on such a footing, we became less and less interested in ourselves because self is not running it. Our little plans and designs more and more became interested in seeing what we could contribute. That's doing God's work now. And it says, this is what I experienced. As I, as I surrender self, I discovered that I felt new power flow in. I start to enjoy peace of mind. I discover I can face life successfully. And I become conscious of God's presence. And I begin to lose my fear of today, tomorrow, and the hereafter. That I am reborn. I lose my fear because now I'm trusting in God. And I can tell you, when I'm in God-centered love, I feel peace and serenity. And the gift of that is acceptance. So we go through, and we finally, with my sponsees, is we... I have them pray and pick a spot in Alaska someplace that just really means a lot to them. It's very beautiful. It could be on top of a mountain. It could be in a valley looking up. Um, and I asked them, pick a spot, and that's where I want us to go. But bring all your work ready to do, start your fourth step. And we're going to see why that's important. So we get there. We kneel down. Uh, we've had a moment of silence. And I say, God, I offer, which means I'm 
sacrifice. If you look up the word offer, it's a type of sacrifice. Like I'm now willing to give up self. It doesn't work for me. So God, I offer self. I offer myself to thee to build with me and to do with me as thou will. And here it is. I'm asking God to relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties at victory over them. May bear witness to those I would help of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. May I do thy will always. Now, taking away my difficulties, it doesn't say so that I have a better life, so that I have a better relationships. It's really about bearing witness to the power of God. And I believe that when I do bear that witness of his power, his love, and thy way of life, which I believe comes in that order, coming in as an addict, um, that I'm doing God's work that I'm showing up to be a channel and allowing God to use me. And it goes on to say, and I'll drop to the bottom of this paragraph, because I think this is the whole point right here. The wording was of quite, of course, quite optional. So long as we express the idea of voicing it without reservation, that this was only a beginning. Though if honestly and humbly made an effect, and sometimes a very great one was felt at once, and there's a place in the book that gives me a great story. And those that are familiar with the big book, um, a Jim's story, Jim started drinking at 35. So it's on page 35. Let's go there for a second. Everybody kind of knows what Jim's story is about on page 35 is Jim adds whiskey into his milk. And I believe that's because self had came back. It puts me to sleep. And somewhere along the way, I'm believing that it's okay to take a drink, to add whiskey to my milk or lust into my life in some form. But I think a, a very important part of Jim's story <clears throat> is this whole thing about making a beginning. So let's look, Jim was, you know, he was a great salesman. He owned an automobile, but he started drinking. He lost everything. His family was separated from him. So this, the third full paragraph of the page kind of tells us Jim hit his bottom he had lost everything. He was separated from his family. And I think this is an important paragraph to look. We told him, which he came in contact with the fellowship, of what we knew of alcoholism or addiction, step one. And the answers we had found, step two. And Jim made a beginning, step three. So you come in, you work steps one, two, three, right? All remarkable things start happening. What happens for Jim? His family was reassembled. Jim had a lot of affection for his family. So, man, things started getting better right away. And he began to work as a salesman for the business he had lost through drinking. So all went well for a while. But we have to ask, why was this not permanent? Why did this not continue to last? And I, I think the answer is because Jim got sober Many people that come into this program, work steps one, two, three, things start getting better and they let up. Steps four through nine, the spiritual program of action, we're going to look at why is that so important? Because if we don't, but what happened to Jim? He failed to enlarge his spiritual life. That's what happened to Jim. His self took over and convinced him it was okay to take a drink. He started to get sick again. He started to go asleep. So we go back on page 63. We're almost uh, coming up here. So this is only a beginning. So when we take steps one, two, three, most of the point along our fellowship at this point, man, we're getting cleaned up. We're feeling better. We're fellowshipping with people. We're starting to have relationships. But we get introduced to this idea to start looking inward. We start looking at self to just see exactly what's going on. And for most people, that's overwhelming. Well, let's look and tells us, once we took that third step prayer, and this was only a beginning, it tells me in the bottom paragraph, next, and we'll see later at once, whatever's quickest, we get up from that prayer with my sponsees, we walk over to a table, we walk to our vehicles, and we start step four right then. I do not delay. Next, it tells me. This is how important it is. And this next paragraph, I hope will be laid into your heart in a brand new way, if, unless you're already a big book, you know, you really see this. Next, we launch down on a course of vigorous action. Now, this is why they call this the spiritual program of action, steps four through nine, because it takes action. And for me, 
I'm so grateful that I really looked at it as a time to really start connecting with God. I was taught to pray and let God do the inventories for me. It's, it's not an intellectual thing that I'm to, I would go and take my chair, get my coffee down by a creek. I would say a few, you know, five minutes of meditation and prayer. And then I would just open up and be, a, okay, God, what's next? And we're going to start looking as we start those inventories. It tells us what is next. But it says we started on a vigorous action. The first step is, which is a personal house cleaning, which means I'm going to start looking at me. And it goes, which many of us have never attempted. I never looked at me. Everybody else was a problem. And here it is. This next three sentences is what this whole share is about. Though our decision, right, my third step to quit playing God, to allow self to be defeated and deflated, was a, was a vital and crucial step. I can't have this without, but here it is. It could have little permanent effect. Underline little permanent effect. That was Jim's problem. He worked steps one, two, three. Now they're telling me that was great, but it will have little permanent effect at less at once, followed by a strenuous effort to face and be rid of the things where? In ourselves, which had been blocking us. Self had been blocking me. I, I, I don't, I couldn't see it. It showed me back there what self was, right? Fear, resentment, selfishness. All of those things have been blocking me. Resentments is a number one offender. And it tells me that our lust, our addictions, our lust, our liquor, all of that was just a symptom. It has nothing to do with what has been blocking me. So we had to get down to causes and conditions. And while we don't have time to go through all of the inventories, Man, this is the part where I get my prayer tools, where I, I list out, God shows me these people and um, start going through it. My sponsor would say, if God brings it to mind, don't try and judge whether that person needs to go on your resentment. Let's put them down. Because God's going to show me something that I have long buried or can't see as I go through the work. I'll like, oh, I had forgot. Him. Oh, I totally didn't remember that. I'm letting God do the work at this point. And so as we go through those inventories, four through nine, the spiritual program of action, we end up with the nine step promises start happening, I believe, as soon as we start doing one, two, three, but it really starts happening. So we end up on page 84. We've just read about our nine step promises. It's a beautiful promise. Our life is changing. And why is our life changing? Because self has been deflated through the work of four through nine. Just because I make a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God, it doesn't happen in my experience without those inventories. That's what does the work. That's what crushes it. And then now that I'm free, the blockers are gone. I'm experiencing God-centered love. It tells me at the very bottom of 84, and we've ceased fighting anything or anyone, even our addiction, lust, alcohol, drugs. For by, this time, for by this time, sanity will have returned. And it goes on to tell me on the next page that when self is deflated or defeated and God is in, has full reign, I'm been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. It's not me doing anything. It's now God being in control because I've not even sworn off. Instead, the problem has been removed. And remember, we looked back, what, what is the problem? It's not lust. It's not alcohol. It's not drugs. The problem is a lack of power. And what was the power I was using was self. It doesn't work. Um, if it's so important that I do realize that it's not a lack of faith or trust or these drugs or alcohol, it's a lack of that power. Self has to be deflated. And it goes on to tell me a little bit further down here, and I got about just a few minutes left is this is how we react so long as we keep in fit spiritual dish condition. And it tells me in 70 somewhere that my real purpose is to fit myself to be of maximum service to God and his fellows. My job isn't to be of maximum service to God and his fellows. My job is to fit myself. That's my only job. My job is to keep watch of selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear, and recognize when self is trying to take back over. That's the 911. When self takes back over, 
if I don't immediately start working my program around that with the four instructions it gives me there, man, temptation will come next, then lust or wanting to drink or medicate in some way. And then eventually acting out or using is the last thing that happens. So it tells me that it's easy to let up on the spiritual program of action and rest on our laurels. We are headed for trouble if we do for lust and addiction for self, I would say is a subtle foe because I'm not cured. What I really have is a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. So how do I, last thing I'll say is on page 14, if we go there, um, it tells me, how do I enlarge my spiritual condition? Bottom of the page, it tells me, Ebby's sitting here talking to Bill W. And it says that my friend, Ebby Thatcher, had emphasized the absolute necessity of demonstrating these principles in all my affairs. That's the 36 spiritual principles we learn in the steps, traditions, and concepts. Particularly was it imperative to work with others as he had worked with me. And here's what it says. Faith without works was dead. And he said, and how appallingly true for the alcoholic or the addict. For if I, me, fail to perfect and enlarge my spiritual life like Jim did, and now it tells me how to do it through work and self-sacrifice for others, I could not survive the certain trials and low spots ahead. That's a daily truth for me. If I'm not doing the work, I will not survive the trials and low spots ahead. And if I don't work, then God will, then I will surely drink. And if I drink, I will surely die. And so I'll leave you with this. In self, I'm doing God's job. In surrender, when God is in control, I get to do God's work. I don't try and no longer do God's job. And what I find that if I stop doing God's work, then I start trying to do God's job again. And self returns and my life is unmanageable. And we all know the rest of that story because that's why we're here. So I don't want to do God's job anymore. I want to do God's work. And that's why I get to daily when I get asked, do you want to speak? Man, I don't feel worthy to come in here and speak. I really don't. But I want to do God's work. And so I show up, I pray. I had some fear. I took started to take a walk because I wanted to meditate. And um a guy called right then. And I thought, you know, Dennis, this is God's work. You do God's work. And I sat and shared with him on my walk before this meeting. So that's what I want today. I want to continue to do God's walk. I mean, God's work. And the day I stop doing God's work, then I'm going to start doing God's job again. And I'm a dead man walking past. Mm. Dennis, thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, your share. And that uh, wrap up of doing God's job versus doing God's work is something that uh, just smacked me right between the eyes. I really appreciate that. And it'll give me something to really ponder and, and dig into as we progress. Hey, do you mind taking about 30 to 60 seconds and sharing a little bit about your primary fellowship and how that helps you before we get into the Q and a portion of this meeting? Yeah, I, I would love to. Um, I'm really an, an addict in several programs, but sexaholism because of my sexual abuse early on, I use drugs and alcohol to try and drown that, to try and find oblivion. Um, but I'm a sexaholic at heart. That's what I suffer from the most. The rest of it is just, if I'm not going to be a sexaholic, I got to use something. Unless self is deflated, then I don't need anything except this program and to work with others and feel that connection and love. So Sexaholics Anonymous has really helped me come into this program. I don't speak for Sexaholics Anonymous. I can only share about my experience. If anything I said here today differs from what your sponsor is telling you, listen to your sponsor. He's right. This is just my experience. And um, so Sexaholics Anonymous, from day one, I came in on July 29, 2014. I was told to get a sponsor. I did that day. And I've been sober ever since. And I was a hardcore sexaholic. Um, tw at 12, I started trying to get free. And it took till I was 52. And I crossed every boundary and I couldn't stop. So this program gave me the freedom if I do the work, if I stay close to him and perform his work well. And that's my only hope. And, and I'm just thankful it's here. I tried everything and it didn't work. So I do thankful for my program. Pass. Beautiful. Thank you very much, Dennis. 
All right, for our listening audience, our live audience, if you have questions for Dennis, please type them in the Q&A link there at the bottom of your Zoom window. It looks like two speech bubbles over the top of each other, and I'll uh, read those to him as they come up. I've also got a couple of questions that I wrote uh, that I'd love to ask of Dennis, so we'll we'll jump into the Q&A portion of the meeting here now. So, Dennis, you mentioned a little th- uh, a little bit about um, being sober is not the same thing as being well. Can you please dig a little bit deeper on that and share a little bit about, you know, maybe the difference between abstinence, sobriety, recovery, and healing, being well? That would be very helpful, I think. Yeah, for me, um, I can be completely sober and not using, but I can be a dry drunk or um, inside what it is, is when, because now, you know, I use because of the separation from my higher power, because self is in control and disconnected from my higher power. And it says in XXVIII that men and women drink essentially because it says um, to them, their sexaholic life seems the only normal one. That's the only one I could survive with. They are restless, irritable, and discontented unless they can again experience a sense of ease and comfort, which comes at once and by taking a few drinks. Well, see, the restless, irritable, and discontent came before they took the drink. They're needing to take the drink. So sober, if I'm not in recovery, if I'm not getting to the source of the real issue is self, I'm going to live in restless, I'm going to be irritable, and I'm going to be discontented, and I'm going to be very difficult to live around. I'm going to be in depression. I'm going to be in a ton of fear. I'm going to be in a ton of self-pity because I'm thinking everybody's doing it to me. So I'm, I am a very sick man. So sober is not well. Recovery is doing the work and deflating self. That's the real disease in my life. It's I'm powerless over self. And when self is running the show, I've thought about killing myself to try and get out of that pain. Um, but I don't need to do that. I don't need to be in depression. And I'm not saying that that sometimes counselors and medical professionals aren't needed. I have a counselor. And I think it, like my counselor said yesterday, he can't give me what the 12 steps gives me. And sometimes the 12 steps can't give me what he offers. And so he can help me with some childhood trauma and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, being sober is not well because I'm still in my disease. I'm still in self. And I'm still harming people because I'm being dishonest. Um, I'm manipulating, you know, right away. I know if I'm in self because I'm starting to be disturbed again. And right. It tells us on page 90 of the 12 and 12 that anytime I'm disturbed, it's always something in me. Usually if somebody's making me angry or I don't like something about what they're doing or saying they are the teacher or the mirror that has shown up and is reflecting something in me, I get to pause and go, okay, I'm, disturbed by this person they're the teacher and mirror to show me what is inside of me that i get to recognize and bring to god for healing that's really they're they're really a gift and if i can remember when i'm disturbed to really get to start praying and looking within and talking to somebody and uh and and that's a great warning signal for me the 911 is self is back not that i'm getting ready to drink or act out that's when my nine that's when i recoil from as from a hot flame because like uh uh-oh Self is back. I'm in trouble. And, and self would does at times return every single day, would wants to try. I get up, slide out of bed every morning and do my prayers. But really, recovery is happens in the moment of the day. You know, and I, I if I'm in the future, I'm full of fear and back in self. If I'm in the past, I'm full of resentments and regrets and self-pity. So really, God has found it in the moment. He, that's the only place I can truly find peace is if I'm here in the here and now. And as an addict, I got to make sure that I don't get too high and that because then there's this crash that'll go too low. So if I just kind of stay in that middle place, which some people call boring, actually turns out to be a very a peaceful place of solitude that I get to connect with God. Pass. Thanks, Dennis. Um, a follow-up to that. Um, you said when self rears its ugly head in, in your life, that's the 911 moment. When that happens, what does your personal surrender, your personal um, giving self and getting away from self, what does that look like to you? 
Yeah. And, you know, there's a nightly inventory on page 86 that asks these questions. I, I can't express enough. Do the 10th and 11th step with somebody in this book that really knows it because when I retire at night, that doesn't mean when I'm getting ready to climb into bed. That means after I've had dinner and me and my wife are going to take just a moment apart to kind of retire because she knows I'm going to go do my nightly inventory. And I answer these questions, you know, where was I resentful, selfish, dishonest, or afraid? And I ask God before, because it says we constructively review our day. It doesn't mean we destructively review it. We constructively review it. Show me God where I was. Do I owe an apology? Have I kept something to ourselves? When I fill this out every single night, and send to another person. The next day as I'm starting my day and as I'm going through my day, boy, I can't, I already know what I'm going to write here. It's like, oh, that's going to my list. If I, if I say this, you know, am I being kind and loving toward all? That's inwardly as well as outwardly. So it helps me see. And, but when these crop up, because they do, not if, it tells me what I should do. Continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. And when these crop up, it gives me four instructions. I ask God at once to remove them. I discuss them with someone immediately, right? Ask God to remove them in steps one, two, three, and six and seven, because there's a defect happening. I discuss them with someone immediately, step five. And I make amends quickly if I've harmed anybody, steps eight and nine. So those are all of the inventories and everything that we've learned in the tools, the spiritual tools to deal with self. And then it says, then we resolutely turn our thoughts to someone we can help. In my experience, when I'm being plagued by self, I go through this process. The moment I even think about helping somebody, much less do it, but just think about, okay, I'm going to call, bam, it's gone. It really, really sets me back because now I'm starting to do God's work again. How can I help another? And love and tolerance is ever, others is our code. I'm also in another program, Al-Anon, that really helps me with my people pleasing and, so, and codependency and, you know, all of that too. So, um, yeah, but that's what I do is if I have a resentment that a quick spot inventory check doesn't work, like I'm like holding on to something and I don't feel the freedom, then I go back and do a real four step on it and to where I feel nothing but love and compassion, never to be brought up again. Like that, God has to do that. And once that happens, and then God can show me my mistake in it, because I can't see my mistake if I'm holding on to a resentment. And it tells me on page 66, when harboring such feelings, which are resentments, I'm shut off from the sunlight of the spirit. It tells me right there, man, I'm shut off from God. And it tells me what happens. The insanity of lust, alcohol returns, and we drink again into for us to drink is to die. So in order for me to do my fourth column in my resentment inventory, I have to be free from the resentment as though it never happened. And I'm telling you, it took months going through my program, praying, doing the prayer work. And I'd ask myself, sometimes I would just start the prayer work and whew, I could just feel God lifted out, never to be brought up or charged against them again. That was God doing that. Then I can go, and God can show me my part. And I remember as I wrote out all those columns, I didn't think about it as I was writing them. I went back and asked, well, where's, my, where's all my, my defects? He goes, well, they're in your fourth column. I went back and looked and I thought, oh my God, this isn't me. I'm a nice guy. But I started reading all of that and I realized that there was a theme on one thing and I looked it up in, in Google and it was schadenfreude. And schadenfreude is, one of the, it said one of the worst possible human traits that I actually take mis I actually take joy in other people's misery and I thought my God I couldn't see it but God showed me my real heart and my my life so I do steps ten in, in, the, in that nightly inventory and part of eleven on a daily basis that's why ten eleven and twelve daily will keep me that from needing to do four through nine and you know that just gets me cleaned out. 10 and 11 a day keeps those blockers free. Or I go back into self and suffer and people around me do. Awesome. Thank you. And I'd like to kind of boil that down at least how I understood it and, and rephrase it so it sticks with me a little bit better and maybe yes, please. with others. So basically when I recognize that self is 
sticking in there when a, a character defect is jumping in and and uh, rearing its ug- ugly head. First, I recognize it and I give it to God. I say, God, take this from me. Maybe sp- definitely specifically mention, hey, pride and ego is jumping in here, God. I, I give this to you. And then the next thing, immediately call somebody else, reach out to somebody else and make it so it's not a secret and share it with them mm-hmm. and then go and do the next good thing. Is that kind of what uh, what Beautiful. you shared there? Absolutely, 100%. Um, awesome. I, I always, my early prayer from day one, and, and I remember as I was writing out my early section, sexual childhood abuse, when I got hit with the compulsion, man, I couldn't. I just had to, wherever I was at, I had to go act out. I remember on day four, I was writing it out and all of a sudden, oh, it hit me again. And this prayer is what saved my life the entire time is, God, I am powerless. I need your power. Please lend me your power just for today so thy will be done. And in that moment, for the first time in day four, I felt like a wind hit me. And honestly, that compulsion has never returned. Now, the obsession, I, you know, a temptation. I'm not free from temptation. But temptation, every temptation is an invitation to turn to God. That's all it is. It's just something, my addict's wanting something. Myself is back in control. Pass. I think what you just shared there, Dennis, is um, really powerful. And it's something that I'm uh, working with a couple of guys to try and help clarify that. I was wondering if you could help me so that I can better see it. Temptation in and of itself is not the obsession or the compulsion no. or the no. equivalence of acting out. Share a little bit about that. That Go deeper on the temptation is an invitation to turn to God, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah. Let me give you a story first, and I'll tell you. Real quick, I was driving to some place, and I haven't been down this one road where there's tons of prostitutes. And I remember early on in my program, I was driving and totally forgot. All of a sudden, I thought about it. I'm like, oh, my God. And the temptation was overwhelming in that moment. And I prayed, and I called somebody. And in that moment, I judged my program is not working. God, my program's not working. I called the guy, and he goes, man, it sounds like it's working great. You should actually be happy because you prayed and you made a call. Your program's working good. And I don't experience that anymore like that. Um, But a temptation is not a drink. And this is my, I'm just going to tell you my own experience. I have, if I have a temptation to take a drink, it's not a drink. In my experience, and I'll just use because of my sexaholism, I see something or a thought comes to mind that I want to take, run that thought or take that drink in of that person's second look, whatever you want to call it. When that temptation first comes, for me, I have one second to either go to God or pause. I ruminate about it. Now I'm back in trying to fight it myself and it doesn't work. But if I will immediately go into God, even if my addict inside wants that, it's like the quiet dying upward. I'll go to God immediately because I'm going to give up something my addicts want and say, God, I'm powerless and I need your power. Please lend me your power just for today because I'm powerless over my lust. Immediately, 100% of the time, if I go to God, God's presence will flood in. I'll feel relief from that temptation. I'll experience his comfort, his joy. And what changes is my thinking. It's like, I really don't want that. In that moment, that's all I wanted. And those temptations, and the more I go to God, go to God immediately, they get further and further and further apart. And those temptations of power gets less and less till they're just a little wispy thing of smoke. Oh, there it is. Okay. Has no power. But I can't ever believe that I have the power to resist that. I just stay close to God, perform his work well. But the opposite is true. If I pause in that moment of that why in the road, I'm now fighting it. And I'll never know the power of a temptation until I try and resist it. I cannot fight temptation. I That is not none of my business. I have to let go. Even though I've surrendered and they get further away, if I see something or I'm thinking a thought and all of a sudden I pause and I take that drink, I run that scenario in my mind, that's, that's poison for me. That's like the alcoholic taking alcohol in. 
immediately it goes that courses through my veins and I am affected. I have an allergic reaction and I'm suffering now because now I'm no longer, for whatever reason, I was tempted because I'm not dealing with some resentments or some feelings or some fears, you know? So temptation comes and says, Hey, here you go. This will take care of it. It'll relieve it. And if I take the drink, um, in my experience, God has never removed the effects of the drink I've taken. Not for me. Um, now I'm in a place where, and I haven't done it. Am I going to act out or am I going to suffer while this drink dissipates out of my body? You know, am I going to go pick up trash? Am I going to get on the phone and call somebody? Am I going to be of service in some way while this drink dissipates out of my body? But if I take that drink, then those temptations get closer and closer and build with more power if I don't start really working my program. So for me, you know, it's um, a temptation is just that. And eventually they become like a little leaf. You know, you see them blow by and up oh, there it is. Okay. Or you can call my sponsor and say, Hey, guess what? You know, the lady in the car next to me looked at me and this meant that to me, you know, that's my crazy sexaholic thinking. Um, but it doesn't have any power anymore. Uh, it, what's where it's going to gain power is if I stay in self trying to run the show. Now I'm going to have to medicate the separation from God again. Thank you, Dennis. Um, I really appreciate your time today. Before we uh, close this out, do you have any final parting words of wisdom from your own experience, strength and hope that you'd like to share with us? Mm. Yeah, I guess if you're on step four, because a lot of times you see that, you know, people that are chronic relapsers or coming in this program, they've been in for years. I'll ask them, well, what step are you on? Well, I made it to step four. I didn't do, man, if you haven't done steps four through nine, the spiritual program of action, please embrace it. It's the most beautiful prayer tools and principles. And when you start it, it won't make any sense. But as you go through it, it makes all the sense and it just changes you. The, this isn't a, a program of knowledge. I can quote all this. I can memorize it. But if I'm not practicing it, it will do nothing for me. So I have to follow the instructions as given to me by my sponsor. And if you're just new and getting a sponsor, it's not an a la carte system. Because remember, when your sponsor suggests something and you feel that resistance, that's the disease. It has nothing to do with trying to quit drinking or using drugs or quit acting out. That's what we're fighting. So when you feel that resistance, they say, I say, oh, there you are. And man, I go work on that right away. Follow all your sponsor suggestions. Set time aside. This has to come first. And if you do, and you start doing the work, it's like pedaling a bike. You start pedaling, it's like hard and it's laborious. And then once you get to pedaling, man, the more you do it, the easier it gets. And you don't even realize you're pedaling after a while. You're just doing the work. You're staying in it. And you're really, your whole life changes because you experience a new way of living. It says on like 159, and if somebody knows where it is, 152, that we came into this program so that we could stay sober. But we, here it is right here on 159. These men had found something brand new in life. That's what we're talking about. Though they knew they must help other sexaholics or alcoholics if they would remain sober that motive became secondary. Why? Because it was transcended by the happiness they found in giving themselves for others. Man, I'm telling you, start giving yourselves for others. And guess what? God can use you on day one. Believe it or not. Before, If you're going to call two people a day, call somebody, share. And then before you call that second one, pray and ask God, God, who would you have me call today? God will use you. God uses newcomers to help me all the time. Um, we see that there is no ladder. There's nobody, you know, you see in life, there's either somebody above you on the ladder or below you on the ladder In recovery. We lay it down flat. We're all equals. I need you. You need me. We're here as a fellowship to help each other to make it through. We're just maybe different further down the path than another, but we all really need each other. So I would just pray that do your steps four through nine today go here with your sponsor and start working like your life depends upon it because it really does pass. Thank you so much, Dennis. Um, that was a great RICO 12 weekly speaker meeting for all addicts and those wanting to learn more about addiction and the recovery therefrom. 
If we didn't get to your question or if you have other questions, please go to rico12.com forward slash forum and join in our community and ask those questions and answer others' questions that may come up. I invite the audience to come back next week. If you've not yet gone to rico12.com and submitted your email address to get on the uh, email list so you can join us live each Friday at noon central time, please go do so. Next week, we will, we will be hearing from Radek P. from Poland, whose topic will be sexaholic nuts and bolts of a healthy relationship. And I'm really looking forward to that one. I had a good conversation with him a couple of weeks ago, and I think it'll be a, a powerful conversation. Now, let's launch off into the rest of our day with the submission prayer that's found on page 51 of Step Into Action. Uh, Dennis, if you wouldn't mind taking us out with that. All right. For a moment of silence for those who are still sick and suffering in and out of these rooms. God, I offer myself to thee. I'm excuse me, that's my third step. God, I offer this day to you. Establish the work of my hands, the steps of my feet, the words of my mouth, the direction of my gaze, the thoughts of my mind, and the attitude of my heart. Amen. Amen. Keep coming back, everybody. It works when I work it, so work it. You are worth it. Still searching for a glimpse